thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who gets to actually talk about something in French or in French Canadian to be more specific with the album Picture de Ipse Musique Directe by Hubert Lenoir. Hubert Lenoir. I'd like to thank Vincent Bilodeau for suggesting this in one of my comments. Uh, I found this album and I immediately fell in love with it. Like, <laughs> And I'm telling you, okay, you might be a little bit afraid of the fact that it's in French. And it is all in French, Canadian French, so there's a lot of English in it. But still, I really suggest that you give this a chance. Je vais pas parler en français, pas du tout, même pas avec un joli accent canadien. Because you need to listen to this album even if you didn't understand what I just said. You need to. It's part of the goal of this channel. One of my goals in having it is to combat linguistic imperialism. Okay? English hegemony. If you were born and your native tongue is English, you have a privilege on par with the privilege of any other privilege. You know, race, class, skin color, gender, etc. Of all the privileges, this is probably the one that is least spoken of, but I think it's important for us to combat seeing as most of the world is not born speaking English, right? But yet, most of the world is dominated by English culture, English business practices, everything with English hegemony. So this album is interesting because it is a great, I've covered other acts from Montreal before, but very few of them actually even sing in French. And it's part of what makes Montreal such an interesting place, what makes Quebec such an interesting province, is that this linguistic imperialism has been fought against in some of the hardest circumstances in the world, okay? Like, French Canada is an island within an island, right? They have to fight off English America, in, they have to fight off English American, they have to fight off French uh, English, you know, like they have to fight off all these different ways to maintain their linguistic identity. And when they do, the result of that is sometimes just alienation and sometimes even oppression. So fight your way through to listen to this totally enjoyable, uh, it's called self-portrait in Latin, that's what picture de ipse means, and it is sort of a, a, a self-portrait, right? It's a self-portrait of a very interesting, fun, young guy who's kind of glam, androgynous, he's funky, he's fun, he's odd, he's engaging, he's able to write pop hooks, he's able to be somewhat avant-garde, he's able to sing beautifully, play guitar well, he's sort of a, a force of nature, like when you listen to him, like you just, his charisma is so engaging, he's such a great pop star uh, that's somewhat hidden by his language. So it's sort of the self-portrait of, of a person like that, but it's also more. And to that, I want to talk about the subtitle that he gave to his own album, Musique Direct. So give me a, permit me a little, little, little tangent here to talk about Musique Direct because he says directly on the album and in interviews that he is trying to make in music what filmmakers made with what is called Cinema Direct or Direct Cinema. You might have heard of Direct Cinema. You can read about it on the internet and watch videos about it. It's the concept of having a documentary that, uh, and particularly the school started, the school of thought started in the late 50s, early 60s, when cameras got lighter, when sound equipment got lighter, where you'd make documentaries with, like no, no voiceovers and no lights, just like a camera and the subject, and just sort of filming people and filming people's reactions, life as it's lived. At the time, that was very revolutionary, and if you watch videos about it, they'll talk all about the great giants of direct cinema like D.A. Pennebaker and his movie Don't Look Back, or Salesman by the Maisels Brothers, right? But usually, they mention in passing, developed in Canada, and then they move on. Why is this? Of course, because not only is there an English he uh, cultural hegemony, there is an American cultural hegemony. This is a Canadian art. More specifically, an art that was developed in Quebec. So I want to take a second to study one piece of Cinema Direct. Uh, Les Racateurs by Michel Bro and Gilles Groul. What names? And sort of think about it and then sort of apply it to, to the album itself. You know, like, like what would it be to be Musique Direct? So if you've never seen Les Racateurs, you must watch it. It's like 15 minutes long. It's in French, but there's very little dialogue, so it won't matter if you don't understand it. I didn't understand all of it because the accent is actually difficult for me to parse with my Parisian ears. So it's from 1958, 
and I'll put a link to it in the description. Seriously, go watch it. It's better than this video, okay? <clears throat> it's, it's even better than the album I'm reviewing. Like, do yourself a favor and watch this 15 minutes. You, you won't regret it. But it's this like great movie about like the snowshoe race. That's what racateur means, They're, like snowshoers. A snowshoe race in Sherbrooke, uh, Quebec, which is a very small city in Quebec. And it's like about this race and about a parade and about a dance after the race. And it's this event, some kind of cultural event, obviously very related to Quebec culture with it being about snowshoes. But what's amazing is the little vignettes that the directors are able to put in here. Like a trumpeter with a cigarette. <laughs> He's like playing trumpet really well and he has a cigarette in his hand. Or a greaser with an Elvis patch on the back of his jacket watching this parade go through. And this parade itself has all these majorettes who are like, seem kind of like lonely and kind of displaced and like the, the parade is, is, is interrupted by a train going halfway through it. And it's like, there's not that many people, but it's this great spirit. You feel this like local pride, but also local ennui. You see these races with these people running and these dogs chasing after the racers. That's rural, it's urban. You, there's this great party at the end where you see everybody dancing and, and all together and like these musicians just doing this, <laughs> this, this crazy performance. Like there's a, harmo there's a harmonica player who seems to be literally eating his harmonica. You just can't believe it. If the internet were better, there'd be memes upon memes upon memes based on these musicians, okay? But here we have this movie. And it really is able to create this vignette where I felt like I was in Sherbrooke in 1958. I felt like I was there. And I think it's an interesting idea to mix a self-portrait with this concept. You know, how successful is Hubert Lenoir of just being a fly on his own wall and showing how his life is? Now, if you're really still afraid of, of listening to this album because it's all in French, I want to give you a quote from my wife, the doctor and missus, upon watching this movie, upon watching Les Racateurs. She said, I don't know at all what's going on, but it's very amusing. And I think that's what you're going to discover with this album as well. You might not get all the references that are happening. You might not understand everything. But put yourself in a position of somebody in Jakarta who has to listen to American radio and hears a song and doesn't really know what it's like. They don't know at all what's going on. But they're very amused by it. His style itself is this great mixture. He calls it um, like, like a French chanson, you know, which is like a whole genre of French music, um, but degenerated, right? And that's kind of what it's like. It's very poppy, very catchy. Um, it has kind of like a, a bedroom feel, right? But it's like got these weird like avant-garde touches all the way throughout, which makes it just fascinating and, and like never boring. Like it's always fascinating to listen to. It's very, very much androgynous, even in his singing, at times where I, I thought there's actually a female singer. He's very androgynous in his presentation. He's also apparently dealing a lot with his fame. That's what I think a lot of this album is about, which is funny, right? Because fame, this is Thunderground Thursday. This is where I talk about artists that you haven't really heard of or probably haven't heard of. How have you not heard of this very famous person? Well, because Quebec is its own island, you know? It's, it's a place within a place, right? <laughs> so you may not know this, but Quebec has its own media landscape that's completely separate from the Canadian media landscape, right? It has a whole celebrity culture, a whole culture that is completely separate, not only from America, but from the country that it's in. So this person, Yves Noir, is famous for appearing on a reality TV show, the equivalent of The Voice, and showing off his butt. And it had a fleur-de-lis tattooed on his butt that appeared to be ejaculating. Now this is funny in a lot of different ways. <laughs> um, first of all, just having a fleur-de-lis tattoo itself is a bit bizarre because, um, you know, like in, in French colonies, runaway slaves would be branded with, with a fleur-de-lis. Uh, criminals in the, French, uh, in the French courts would be branded with a fleur-de-lis. Prostitutes would be branded with a fleur-de-lis. Many prostitutes would actually be then sent, even with that branding, to Quebec to make sure that all those trappers had women to have babies with. So a lot of, a lot of people from that part of the world are, are legitimately uh, descended from either voluntary or semi-voluntary immigrants from France to French Canada, Nouvelle-France. 
so it is an interesting image, right? Like as somebody who ha has studied a little bit of Canadian, uh, Franco-Canadian culture, it is a very powerful image, a very powerful thing to do. The very image of Quebecness, and here he is insulting it, but not really even insulting it, sort of implying his sort of sexuality and his queerness or his bi-ness or whatever it is. It shows off a real side of him, which is he's kind of an imp, you know? He's like a very talented imp, like kind of trolly, kind of like, Hard, hard to describe. I think imp is really the word. So let me go, let me give you an example. You've been listening to me talk for 10 minutes. Let me give you an example of what this music is like. I'm gonna give you a piece of homework to watch this video, which shows his visual style, which is quite good as well, and his musical style. It's called Dimanche Soir, which means Sunday night. So you follow a link to it up there and you can watch this video and listen to the music. It's sort of like a lot of this album. You know, where it's like very soulful. It reminds me actually of Barry White, like sort of like a 100 Gex Barry White mashup, you know. The great, like, Barry White's music always has this great, like, sexual menace in the way the hi-hat is played. It's a complicated thing, but listen to the hi-hat of, 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 Barry, of Barry White's music and this. I think you can hear what I mean. A great example of his song construction and his just charisma that just comes through. You know, the whole thing seems to be about kind of the dog-eat-dog -dog nature of the world, you know, like count your money, everyone's out for themselves. It's about becoming what he hates. A lot of this album is about sort of struggling with who he was versus who he is. Uh, and very confessional. Même si je suis pas straight, je peux te parler straight dans yeux. Doing my best with the accent there. Uh, even if I'm not straight, I want to talk to you straight in your eyes. You know, this the sense that he's trying to communicate something here. Beautiful kind of stuttered guitar, kind of distorted. Reminded me of uh, the guitar work on Walk On By by Isaac Hayes. And then at the end, they did something they do a lot. There's, there's two things that are on this song that are all the way throughout the album. One is that Cool and the Gang, Summertime Madness uh, synthesizer trick. You know, the kind of West Coast synthesizers that... You know, that kind of uh, jumping around between octaves, West Coast sounding synthesizers. The other is it ends with sort of ambient noises from a metro station. A lot of this album feels like it was recorded in a metro station, a subway station, like, it, like you're hearing a saxophone player and you can't tell if it's being recorded from a street performer or if it's being recorded in the studio. So that's a great example of what makes this album so engaging. And listen, if you can listen to that and say, oh, I don't care about it, that's fine. You can leave. Goodbye. I don't like you anyway. <laughs> but I, if you're like me and you hear that, like, that's great. Like, what's going on? What's happening in the rest of the album? Well, let me tell you. I'm going to go through the rest of the album a little bit quicker, okay? First track is called 942 Nouvel Enregistrement which means new recording. If you have an iPhone, you know that every time you, you click on uh, a voice memo, it says the time and then new recording. So that's what this is. Very much, uh, very much tied into this idea of being cinema direct, that you're actually there with him as he's recording this. But the crazy thing is, it sounds, it's kind of like, you know, like ambient noises and he's kind of talking in sort of a twisted way. And then this beautiful melody seems to come out of nowhere. And he talks about, it's another long day in the city of short love. Um, they, they, want, they, want to, uh, they want to tie the knot with who they are, just like sort of like this image of the city of people kind of running around and just kind of a, uh, a long day. And then this like really beautiful chorus comes in out of nowhere. So it sounds like it's this voice memo, but then it explodes and expands all the way throughout the album. It does that where it sounds small and then it gets bigger and bigger while also being like slightly agitating. Uh, this cool unexpected saxophone loop. This it's like it's like a saxophone sounds like it never quite gets going, and then like a jazzy keyboard comes up from from behind, and then he says directly that he makes music direct, and that's the goal of the album. Next song is called Secret, which means secret. Can you figure that out? Uh, cool kind of odd soul music again, uh, again sort of this sort of. Um, hyper soul, you know, kind of like hyper pop, kind of hyper soul, sort of Ohio Players-ish. A very funny lyric, uh, <laughs> condolences for all those who are like me, which has great phrasing in French. All the way throughout, that is one thing that you're gonna miss if you don't speak French, it's just how good his phrasing is. Condoléances à tous ceux, que, à tous ceux qui sont comme moi. Just a beautiful, just using the French language uh, 
in its most beautiful way. 418W00 is this crazy drum loop, probably my least favorite part of the album. It's okay. I like the kind of beat switch, these jazzy sounds, and, and, and here we have these recorded conversations. And all the way throughout, we have a lot of these recorded conversations. And they're not all like one theme. There are multiple different themes, and it gives into this feeling of Cinema Direct, where we're just kind of hanging around with this person, and someone's talking about being bullied as a kid, and how that bullying gave him motivation, and, and it's a little bit cut off, it's a little bit hard to follow. And again, listen, the French do this really annoying thing, where every time someone speaks with a, French, with a Canadian accent, they subtitle it, totally obnoxious and not necessary. Sometimes it actually is necessary, and it is, legitimately hard even for a French professor to fully follow what's being said here, but it's in that, it's in that area. Hubert Lenoir, C'est Confirmé, is just a weird little uh, interlude that talks about him being the biggest idiot in the world. I guess this is part of, this is part of the thing that I don't know. You know, I live in western New York. I'm five hours from, uh, from the good Canadian border, you know, the French Canadian border, and, and so I don't know. I don't know do people say he's this big idiot, he's this big jerk, just because he did the little, little fleur-de-lis thing? I don't know. That leads into probably, in my opinion, one of the best songs on the album, Cat Car, which, which is the French word for pound cake. Four quarters, because in order to make pound cake, you have four ingredients in equal, uh, in equal proportion. I was told there'd be no math. So this appears to be partly about so there's another thing about French Canada, which maybe you don't know, maybe you do. Um, French Canada is very Catholic. And much like it is very French, they have to protect their Catholicism from the dominant Protestantism that is all around them. The same way they have to protect French from the dominant English that's all around. So it creates a lot of sort of confusion and anger and pride in the religion because it's a very oppressive religion like most religions are. And it's everywhere in everyone's life, and it's a part of their national and personal identity. So there's a lot of these references to Marie Madeleine and Marie and just all these references here, and, and it feels like it's a little bit about the omnipresence of the church in Quebec life. And, and we're going to talk more about that when we talk about some of the, some of the um, slang later. And he even says, I say adieu even if I don't believe in anything. You know, even the way you say goodbye in French is to God. Right now, I'm talking about the content, lyric, like musically. This is just awesome. It's just like this cool, like Prince style synth pop '80s song. It's just beautiful, and it gets like really exciting. He's really good with dynamics as well. Like in the chorus, he starts yelling. Like he just keeps yelling two fingers and the pound cake. I don't know. I I think this is gay slang, but I don't know. I I I have a dictionary of French Quebec sayings, and and I looked up if there was any kind of thing here about, about pound cake and, and what it means, um, but it's, it's just not here. So I don't know what two fingers in the pound cake is. If you know, please tell me. Même en français. Dimanche soir is the stamp, which I've already given to you. Then Paris Transit, another sort of um, interstitial song with like loud noises and talking about arriving in Paris and like horns honking in the back, which leads into Octembre with Bunny Banane. Oh my God, wait a minute. With Bonnie Banan. I had a prop that I didn't even think to use. Which of course means Bonnie Banana, who's a, a French singer. And it's a really kind of nice duet here. Uh, nice guitar work in the chorus with the horn. And just more in this really cool offbeat soul feeling that dominates the whole album. I've listened to this album, I don't know, five, six times. Like I said, I ordered it. It's gonna be delivered to me soon in the mail. Thank you to my Patreons for paying for that. Um, and I look forward to it. But the thing that just blew my mind was just listening to it, how many songs there are. They're just like, no, 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 that's the best song. No, 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 that's the best song. And here's another one, Hula Hoop. This great doubling of his voice over these low horns and a haunting melody that then builds into a very, very catchy chorus. Just a super cool, catchy chorus. Reminds me a little bit even of like French Ye Ye singing. I don't know, maybe I'm just biased there. Um, but it's all about how life is like a hula hoop, you know, kind of like going around and ups and downs and tons of little tiny production details all the way throughout. This is a thing that uh, computer production, you know, when we talk about Cinema Direct, right? Cinema Direct, Direct Cinema, was, a, was an outcropping of technological advances, right? So I think you could say the same thing about bedroom pop, right? Like 
the advances in bedroom pop, it doesn't lead to a minimalism. It leads to sort of a cool maximalism. So you have somebody who's sitting there with, you know, garage band or whatever uh, audio uh, program they're using, and like they're able to add things in sort of infinitely. So this is cool, like attacking synthesizer in the song, and maybe even a dulcimer. It's going over this beautiful theme about life being like a hula hoop, talking about his dog dying. I'm telling you, this is a theme in music in 2021. There's like been five dead dogs that I've reviewed this year. It's very sad. It makes me want to go home and hug Bo and Toby. <laughs> but it's just a great song, and and this his ability to craft these melodies that uh, I imagine anyone else could just cover these and just do them straight. Just do a straight version, a less interesting, less well-produced version of this, um, but just one that's more radio-friendly. And this would be a huge hit in French Canada. Montreal Transit, follow-up from Paris Transit, just kind of distorted beyond comprehension, but quite interesting, which then leads to MTL style libre, which basically means freestyle translated directly into French. Although often in France, they will say freestyle. Great... This is just, okay, it's like a lo-fi hip-hop song where he's like using hip-hop and it's sort of ironic and sort of not. It's, it's a little bit unclear what his relationship is to hip-hop, you know? He might be using it sort of as a way kind of like laughing at it, but I don't think really. I think he's really just talking about his life in Montreal because he is from Quebec City. And Quebec City and Montreal, it's sort of like San Francisco to Los Angeles, like very different vibes, right? Or like Rochester, New York to... To New York City, right? So it does seem to be sort of about the city, about his alienation there, and like trying to fit in. But the production is just great. It's this guitar and drums that basically don't ever really start, and then these odd sounds build up. And you're now going to get your language lesson. And this is why learning another language is so important and so wonderful. Okay, I'm just I'm just going to spend a little bit of time here with with some of the lyrics from here, because they're enjoyable and they also show what Hubert Le Noir is all about. First of all, we have Crissez-moi la paix. You say that to most French people, they have no idea what you're talking about. If you look up here in, in this book, though, if you're one of those French people who buys this book, you'll learn about les jurons, okay, the swears, which swears in French Canada are primarily based on religious swears. So they don't really say a lot of sexual or scatological swears. They're almost all religious. And this goes back to that omnipresence of the Catholic Church in Quebecois life. My personal favorite is Saint-Simonac. You know, they're famous for saying tabernacle, which means, you know, tabernacle. And we'll get to a couple more here. Christ et moi. Christ is just a, a lazy way of saying Christ. So Christ me, Christ me be, basically, right? Like, just leave me alone. Like, foutez-moi la paix is the way you say in normal French, right? In, in not normal, jeez. How normative, how imperialistic am I being now? In hexagonal France, French, you know, French from France, foutez-moi la paix means, like, get out of here, like, F, F off, essentially. But here it is with crissez-moi la paix. And here we get to these lines here, where it's this great mixture of English slang, Canadian slang, and then beautiful, beautiful French using the subjunctive. I cannot wait to teach this in one of my classes, in one of my upper level classes. Combien de filles? Okay, how many girls? Il faut. This is a Canadian way of saying il. Instead of saying il, they've made it simpler to say i. Very confusing, because that also means there. Okay. Combien de filles? Il faut. Je F word, okay? The F word in English. Pour uh, que mes amis m'admire, so that my friends admire me. This is the subjunctive form, which is required in a subordinate clause that is beginning with pour que. Beautiful French. I would be teaching this in like advanced French grammar, okay? <laughs> so how many girls must I F for my friends to admire me? Combien de dicks... <laughs> Il faut, je suck, que je sois assez queer. So again, we have this, how many, you know, penises must I, you know, que je suck, in order to be queer enough. So it's a great mixture of like English, and this is the most beautiful subjunctive you could possibly have. It's a subjunctive of the form être, okay? <sighs> 
que je sois assez queer. This would make any French teacher happy to hear. F word, calissement, beaucoup men. I don't even know men means beaucoup, calissement means chalicely, as in like a chalice to drink from, as in the chalice that was drunk from at the Last Supper. That's one of their swears. That's one of these French Canadian swears. So all that information, American culture, uh, sexuality, Canadian culture, French language formation, slang French, proper French, it's all located within these little words in this little kind of goofy song. And it's funny, and it's true, and it shows, right, like it shows this crisis that he's having uh, about his own sexuality and his manifestations of his sexuality, and he's just using it just with all these words. And who understands all these things? Well, really, Quebecois understand this, right? That's the thing about language, is it inevitably, and slang, creates an in-group and an out-group. And in Quebec, people are traditionally an out-group. They are not English-speaking enough to be considered Canadian, and they're not American enough to be considered American, and they're sure as hell not considered French enough to be considered French, right? Long history of, of patronizing condescension there. So in creating this language, that uses great French and American slang and it's all mixed up, it means that the only people who understand this easily without any real thought are the French Canadians themselves. It is really important to understand how language functions in music. And it's really important to have some water because <laughs> my voice is cracking. So I don't edit these things. <clears throat> I'm not going to edit that out. Uh, Ville-Marie A. Uh, is in reference to Ville-Marie, which is a part of Montreal. Kind of a song about Montreal again. Um, it's a cool song because it's like, it seems kind of straightforward, but then it gets kind of weird and distorted. And the album cover itself is a picture of his face with one of those Instagram filters on that makes him look all stretched out and weird. That's, I would say, one of the musical things that's directing this, this whole album. Um, and he's so, sort of like talking about like the city and his relationship to it, but then it's also oddly suicidal. <laughs> Um, you know, F the world, F ma vie, that's what he actually says, but it's a great chorus and just a great, like, catchy, interesting song where he's sort of flexing about his city, but then also talking about the alienation and sadness he feels while being in this city. Kind of taking all together this, going back to this concept of cinema direct, we are getting a picture of somebody who's tortured by his sexuality, tortured by where he lives, kind of also just enjoying making all this great music. A really cool, simplistic guitar solo and great bass work all the way through. There's Ville Marie B, which is the second part of this Ville Marie series, which is like basically just an extension, but it's cool because it actually, it's actually sort of warm. So Ville Marie A is kind of a cold song, and this is like the same basic song, the same basic melody, but it's more of a jam. It's kind of like an extended dance cut. It's got some cello on there, I think, some kind of strings. And taken together, it, it makes this whole nice song. Again, there's this real concept of movement in this album. Not just there's actual movement, like the next song is called Quebec Transit. So we have this person who's been in Paris, who's been in Montreal, who's been in Quebec. But also just movement from like small to large and from poppy to abstract and from like fully developed song to like a voice memo. That goes on the next song, Boy, B-O-I, which seems to be... I think, about sort of like a male booty call, maybe an uh, English-speaking lover. It's a little bit unclear. As it goes out, there's this beautiful horn that sounds like it's in a subway and more of those West Coast synthesizers. Really, that's sort of the, the musical trademark of these. And it feels, to, it feels to be another one of these self-portrait images of who is he in relationship, not just to himself sexually, but to others sexually. Ancien Ami is the next inner, you know, interlude, which seems to be maybe the most important. Um, again, the accent's tough, so I'm not sure if I understood this completely. Um, and it's just the slang is just so thick. <laughs> it's, it's not really the accent, it's actually the slang. Like, just certain words are used. And like, I know, like, I know how the French use the word genre, you know, like, kind of, sort of. But then it's used differently here, and it's used often enough that I'm like, is there some other thing I'm missing? Um, but it seems to be about how he's changed and about how this friendship is lost. And that's another theme throughout this album is about like lost friendships and the effects of fame and how they ravage someone's personality and how they ravage someone's life. Which leads into another one of those tracks that I keep saying, this might be the best song on the album, Golden Days. 
uh, it's kind of like a weird sort of like kung fu funk song, very chopped up, chaotic drum sounds to start, and then the voice comes in, everything just settles out. And this chorus seems to come out of nowhere, almost a Bowie-esque sample. Um, and just, it's all, all about like, he says in English, golden days ahead, and then in French, c'est pas, pas comme ça que je vais gagner, je vais gagner le temps, que je vais perdre. You know, this idea that he's going to lose this time. Like, he's not going to gain the time that he's going to lose. So it seems to be about aging and making mistakes. And as this cool jazzy breakdown that leads into the final repetition of this chorus and this weird kind of chipmunk voice. He has a very odd voice all the way throughout the album. He is often altered, pitched up or pitched down, or he sings higher, he sings lower. It's hard to say exactly what his voice is. A great shuffling beat behind here. He claims it is uh, inspired by Home at Last by Steely Dan, and I hear it, but I like it more, because I'm actually, I respect Steely Dan, but I don't usually actually enjoy listening to them. Sucre et sel, Sugar and Salt, is the closest thing to a straight pop song on this album. It's got this great production detail, or production technique, of taking a drum machine with a real drummer and putting them on at the same time. So it just links up and it's just a beautiful sound. And uh, the cool thing is I watched a video of him performing this song on a concert, I mean on a beach somewhere, just with a band around him. And it made you realize like he's a really good performer. Like he can really sing. He can really perform. He really has this great voice, this kind of Beck-like, princey, super catchy chorus. Um, and the whole thing appears to be about the controversy of who he is, about his relationship to you know, more conservative forces in his culture. Et tous les papas de la terre vont me balancer des méchants commentaires. J'ai rien à faire. Je suis sucre et sel, sucre et sel, sucre et sel ce soir. So like, I, I, you know, all the, all the dads on earth are saying mean things about me, but I am sugar and salt, sugar and salt. These are the rules of art. And it seems to be this very sort of metacognitive of what his role is and what the role of being this kind of imp is. Second last track is called Phase, a cool kind of gritty soul track. Um, it's very kind of laid back and funky and it seems to be a follow-up to Ancien Ami, sort of about his old friends um, and even more Metro sounds at the end. And then it ends with the song FPB, which stands for Finished for Good, Finir pour de Bon. Um, and this song is just so unexpected because it starts off and you think it's gonna be another one of these avant-garde, you know, interludes, right? It starts off really gross. Like you hear somebody performing far away and it sounds like somebody is eating something and recording in their front pocket. Like as you get closer and closer, you hear more, but like you hear this person breathing and it's like, it's really kind of just not very pleasant. It actually humorously reminded me of one of my favorite sketches of all time from the podcast Comedy Bang Bang called uh, Apple Trees. You should listen to it. Where it's these people performing a song called I Like Apple Trees and they're eating apples all the way throughout the song. And the sound of eating the apples is so loud that you can't hear any of the singing. This kind of feels like that to begin with. But then you get closer and you start hearing the melody more and you start hearing like his beautiful voice and the guitar and then eventually all that bad recording that <laughs> goes away, all the Fatty McGee sounds and all of a sudden we have this beautiful clear voice and then it builds with bass, you know, this kind of bassy keyboard underneath and there's like a whole kind of like chorus, presumably of himself but with other people as well that come in and he's singing over and over again, we're going to die together uh, but that'll be, uh, we'll be over for good, over for good, over for good. And he's like, this really just transcendental experience is beautiful. Like you just really get lifted up and taken away by this beautiful song that started off so oddly and then it's so lushly textured and that's that travel, right? And that ends with the, the this kind of like uh, loop of strings and more sounds of, of the horns and the night like you're the street performer. So there it is, it is in between a self-portrait and a sort of fly on the wall thing. I don't think it entirely succeeds as a self-portrait or as cinema direct, as music. But I think in trying to do those things, the end result of that ambition is a ridiculously satisfying, great, fun album. Uh, what, what, what was the line uh, that, my, uh, that my wife said again? I don't know at all what's going on, but it's very amusing. So thank you for watching me talk about this album. Please give it a chance, please give it a listen. 
And uh, until next time, where I'll presumably review another thing in English. <sighs> There's the camera.